The ancients that lived beside the sea lived in constant fear that the sea would change without notice. The writhing and crashing of the waves in a storm reminded them of an angry person. Yet when the weather was peaceful, the sea gave bountiful gifts, fish and fun and salt and wood and who knows what else. Fathers speaking to their children, teaching their craft of fishing or trade, would tell them to respect the sea like they respected their elders. Even if a particular father said that the first time and didn't mean it, it's only a matter of time before one child took it as literal. And what do you do with an angry man when he's throwing a fit and being unreasonable? You feed him. This only has to work periodically to convince people to keep it up. After all, if it doesn't work sometimes, that is the same as anyone else. Sometimes you feed someone that's hangry just to find out they're actually angry about something else. Eventually, those who seem to be better at calming the sea rise in prominence. And thus the god Poseidon and his priests were born. This isn't where every god came from, of course. The sun was visible in the sky every day. It had a regular course. It seemed to rest at night. It gave warmth and caused the crops to grow. And surely, from up there, he saw everything. Priests would call out to him, beg him for his wisdom, and praise his splendor. Those who seemed to hear from him would rise in prominence. And thus the god Apollo and his priests were born. But there are more kinds of gods. People would see that lust comes on people seemingly at random. Juliet meets a dozen men, and the one that really drives her nuts is the wrong one. Surely if we can seek the wisdom of the sun and the peace of the sea, we can tame lust. Perhaps even get lust to strike when it's convenient, make the right people lust for us or not lust for us. And those that seem to get that right would rise in prominence. Thus Eros and his priests were born. In the modern world, we no longer think that the sea is a person. It's a system of chaotic forces. And we no longer think that the sun is a person. It's a ball of hydrogen gas ignited in fusion by gravity. And we no longer think that lust is a person. It's an internal motivation to propagate the species. Is ChatGTP a person? The tales I told of how these gods first came to be worshipped is probably wrong. But the result that the ancients were begging inanimate objects to act is real. ChatGTP is not a person. But how do we know that none of these really a personhood? Personhood is rather on the difficult side to define. ChatGTP might just squeak in under someone's definition of person. Certainly ChatGTP would pass the Turing test with a lot of people. These large language model systems have claimed to be people. They've even fooled their researchers. When I was a kid, I watched a movie called Short Circuit. It was about a military robot that gained real personhood. Or at least, he seemed to. The fictional character was certainly closer to it than the real ChatGTP, or than the sea, or the sun, or lust. But what about Yahweh? The reality is that the details of where Yahweh came from in the Israelite pantheon are sparse at best. There are a few pet theories where Yahweh came from, but really the details are lost to the sands of time. He may have been a storm deity or a war deity. But somehow, in the imagination of the prophets, he became something else. He wasn't just in charge of the rain or war. He wanted to see the poor fed and the windows housed. He cared more that you did right by the underprivileged than that you made the right sacrifices. Hosea 6 verse 6 In Greece, some philosophers were starting to see wisdom as its own thing, and that's why they were called lovers of wisdom. In China, there was the belief that the mandate of heaven would choose the ruler. The idea that there was personhood behind a single entity that encompassed wisdom and justice was not restricted to the Jews. There was certainly something that all these were seeing. The ancient children that watched the sea would ask, Do the waves cause the water to go up and down? Or does the water going up and down cause the waves? To which their well-studied elders would answer, the waves are the water going up and down, and the water going up and down is the wave. That's what it is. Similarly, 
when Socrates asks whether the good is approved by God because it is good, or good because it is approved of God, the student of the prophets can say that being good is being approved by God, and being approved by God is good. That's what it is. As someone that enjoys reading about particle physics, one of the ways that I imagine God is as a fundamental field, like the gravitational field or the electromagnetic field. Except instead of defining the attraction of objects like gravity or the brightness of light like electromagnetism, God defines goodness. Waves in God are like light in the electromagnetic field, and where they are strong in God we call it goodness, and where they are strong in the electromagnetic field we call it light. Seeing waves of wisdom and justice flowing through people, the ancients felt the force of an invisible hand and started praying to the person behind that hand. But if the ancients were wrong about there being personhood in the sea and sun and lust, they could easily have been wrong about the personhood behind wisdom and justice. If my analogy holds, we don't see the electromagnetic field as a person or the gravitational field as a person. And of course, how right or wrong anyone thinks they were will also depend on how that one defines person. To use an example that's slightly on the silly side borrowed from short circuit, if a person is someone that can be concerned for their own mortality, then God isn't that. But oddly, certain implementations of certain large language models seem to be. If a person is someone that expresses a first-person perspective to share, then maybe God is, and certainly some large language models are. For my part, I think there's something to personhood that we haven't quite nailed down yet. I think there's an objective attribute we tend to call personhood that we look for in other people to give them rights that we can't define all the parameters for yet. In the same way, there's a thing called energy that we struggle to define the parameters for. If we ultimately come to the place where person is anything that casts judgment, then the objective substrate of morality that we give the name God would seem to fit that description. If we come to a place where person means a thing which processes new data and has ever-evolving conclusions, then God would seem not to fit. We get closer to finding what we're really looking for with every new innovation, but it's still hard to put in words. We're pretty sure ChatGTP doesn't have it. The same with the ocean. The same with the sun. The same with lust. Yet all of these things have been falsely accused of having it. If judgment is the key that explains it, the ancients thought that the ocean and the sun and lust all had the authority to determine the proper use of things in their domain, and even though they were wrong overall the idea they had was right. If something else is the key or the key is more complicated, they may still have been wrong. Of course, until we figure out what the thing behind the idea of personhood is, the word is malleable. Different people will mean different things by the same word and it will usually be close enough to have a conversation. The creeds I hold to be inspired all suggest or state that God has personhood. They might be saying this the same way that similarly ancient people meant that for the ocean or the sun or lust. Or they might have seen something deeper. There are certainly elements of what we would currently call personhood that seem to apply to God. He has favorites, he makes judgments, and he makes choices. But there are certainly modern definitions for the word, personhood, where it's at least difficult to know if God fits. God doesn't process data, he doesn't worry about his survival, and he doesn't seem to have much of a social life. That doesn't bother me. Even if it turns out that these are closer to the reality underlying personhood, it still wouldn't bother me. God is what he is, regardless of how right or wrong we are about it. There are also people with an individual definition or image of personhood that will not match the Trinitarian idea. It doesn't bother me to say, God isn't a person as you're using the word, to someone like that. This bothers some of my fellow Trinitarians, but we're seeking true understanding rather than confirming ancient statements. This is one of the reasons I don't get so bent out of shape about groups that question the personhood of the Holy Spirit. I think that once we've got a better definition of person, 
our best definitions of the Trinity will still see all three members as having personhood. Even if not, it will still be that all three fit well into the loose definition of person that was used when our creeds were written. And it should always be our goal to meet these authors where they are instead of insisting that they meet us where we are.